The smell of spent gasoline and day-old garbage assaulted Derek as he stepped onto the street. He always waited till the sunset to head to McLeod's. That was when the best prospects were out. Derek had wanted the alcohol almost an hour before sunset, but he knew that if he intended to go to bed with someone tonight, he needed to pace himself. A woman might accept a man's advances if she was drunk, but they would rarely spend time with a strange drunk while they were sober. This was a lesson Derek had learned early on, and it was likely the only thing that stopped him from being a full-blown alcoholic. His phone chirped and Derek fished it out, hopefully, wanting to see what cutie was texting him so early. He sighed when he recognized Charlene's number, asking if he would be at the bar tonight. Charlene, the one-night stand who wouldn't take a hint. He had slept with her about five months ago, and the sex hadn't been worth the constant dodge he now had to run with her. Despite his best judgment, he'd taken her out a few times since their hookup, but he had never taken her to bed again. Derek didn't stop for seconds. And as he put the phone back in his pocket, he knew he'd have to cut her off soon. Besides, he had other prospects these days. As he rounded the corner, Derek couldn't help but see the spotlights in front of the old warehouse that had once been a cannery. The man standing out front was doing his best to catch people's interest, but most of them were heading past without a second look. Derek could feel the urge to drink almost as strongly as the urge to bury someone who lived rent-free in his head. But he stopped for a moment as he looked at the sign strung over the door of the warehouse. Derek scoffed as he read the sign. A truly frightening experience, or your money back. What bullshit. The man looked like the titular carnival barker. His jacket was black with red thread to accent the cuffs and collar, not to mention the garish gold buttons that glimmered from the dark cloak. He wore a tall black hat, handlebar mustache, and his grin made Derek think he was not to be trusted. He stood before what looked to be a very old and decrepit warehouse, a place Derek had driven by a thousand times and never looked at twice. And now it was hung with streamers, cast in a buttery light, two searchlights. The windows of the warehouse danced with a murky half-light, like a fire slowly burning out, and the lack of screaming and giggling teenagers coming back out the front door made Derek wary. This time of year, an empty haunted house was always suspicious. Come one, come all, see your greatest fears, realized, or your money back. Derek turned to face the man with a disbelieving eye. That's so. That's so, young man, be warned. This haunted house is unlike anything you've ever experienced before. The house will show you things you didn't know about yourself and tap into what truly scares you. Derek scoffed, but he fished out a twenty and crumpled five and laid it in the box. This better be worth it. Derek grumbled. The barker smiled toothily as he slid the bills into a lockbox. I can assure you, sir, it will be worth every penny. As Derek went inside, his phone chirped. He stopped in the entryway and looked down, seeing a picture of an empty stool with a text that asked where he was. It was from Charlene, because of course it was. She appeared to be waiting to ambush him at his favorite watering hole, he considered just going home and drinking the vodka that he'd been ignoring in the fridge since he'd come home from work, but decided that he wouldn't let her stop him from having a good time. Maybe tonight was the perfect opportunity to break it off with her and make it stick. Derek stepped into a cloud of smoke as a nearby fog machine belched its payload and was suddenly surrounded by an active bar scene. It was pretty well done. It looked just like McLeod, the place he'd been heading. McLeod's was where he often picked up the best trim, and he would likely find himself there tonight sometime. Derek didn't like to go to bed sober, or alone. When he was alone and sober with his thoughts, he inevitably thought of her. He groaned as he walked into the bar, wondering if this was one of those religious haunted houses by Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It had all the earmarks. Hazy bar, people milling around, shadowy corners where bad actors just waited to jump out and startle you. Derek couldn't believe he had just given his money to one of the religious nuts in their revived miracle tents. He supposed he couldn't be too angry. The man had offered a full refund when he got out. 
Derek might as well see what there was to the house and got his 25 bucks back. He approached the bar, not imagining that they had any alcohol, but willing to play along. The man behind the counter, dressed in a usual attire that Thomas always wore. Thomas seemed to love dressing like the old man out in the barbershop quartet. Suspenders, handlebar mustache, striped waistcoat, shiny black shoes, and immaculately coiffed hair. As he approached the bar, however, he noticed something different. His face looked like someone had used an eraser to make it a flesh-colored smudge. He looked up at Derek, silent as the grave as he stared eyelessly at him. Derek tried to order a gin and tonic, but the not Thomas just shrugged and went back to what he was doing, turning away from Derek as he got back to work. Hey, I'm talking to you, Derek yelled. But as he tried to reach over the bar and grab the not Thomas by the sleeve, the man walked away and went to serve some other oddly smudged individuals at the end of the bar. They all seemed to have that weird thing going on with their faces. Derek wondered if there was a theme or something, and if so, he didn't get it. He sighed as he sat back down, waiting for the bartender to come back. The smudged Thomas clone was more like the real Thomas than he knew. He and Thomas had gotten into a fight three nights ago, and Derek's reception at McLeod's had been icy ever since. It was Thomas's fault, really. If he wanted to bed Jeanette, he should have made his move. Derek wanted her. Thomas wanted her. But Derek had struck first, and now Jeanette was just another notch on his bedpost. The problem was that when Jeanette realized she had been nothing but an evening distraction for Derek, she had switched to one of the other dive bars in town, and now Thomas blamed him for running her off. I don't know why I bother to talk to you, Thomas had said. It's like being mad at a dog for eating your sandwich. He's a hungry mutt that only knows he wants to eat. It seems like the bartender might be a little upset with you. Derek jumped and glanced over at a familiar-looking brunette, who had sat down beside him. She was dressed in a short black dress, her leggings artfully ripped, and her shiny black hair hung in her face. When she smiled, he could see teeth that were slowly slipping into unevenness, but he found it charming. The longer he looked at her, the more familiar she seemed, and the less like anyone else he had ever known. He must have slept with some girl he liked. She was drinking something through a straw with a distinctively fruity smell, but the thickness and the color reminded him more of a bag of blood. As he watched it slide up the straw, he felt a little sick to his stomach. He could see her throat working as she drank, her eyes closing as she enjoyed it, and Derek was powerless to break her stare as much as he wanted to look away. As a trickle ran down the corner of her mouth, he finally found the strength to clear his throat and glance around the smoky bar. This was definitely the oddest haunted house he'd ever been to, and he was beginning to doubt his previous suspicions of a religious experience. Do, do I know you? He asked, scanning the bar to see if there was someone else he knew there. The girl was cute, but looking at her made him feel weird in a way he hadn't in a long time. She grinned as she drank, the soupy sound of her drink disappearing up the straw making his skin crawl. It was like listening to someone drain a corpse with a bendy straw. Not for long, no. You think about me often enough. In a way, I'm the reason you do the things you do. I'm never far from your mind, even though you wish I wasn't. You could try to drink me away, Derek. But I'll never truly be gone. Derek laughed, <laughs> but there was no mirth in it. He was thinking the woman had captured his earlier thoughts perfectly. Do you always talk in riddles to people that you just met in a bar? He turned back, but something was different about her. Had she been wearing glasses before? They didn't really fit the elegant dress she was wearing. They were the thick kinds that librarians sometimes wore, the kind that are more functional than form. She was still pretty, but the glasses looked like a prop on this well-dressed young woman rather than something she needed. Only to people who can't understand plain speech. His phone buzzed. Derek checked it to see that Charlene had sent him another text. She wanted to know how he was, to let him know that she was thinking about him. She was so clingy. Why couldn't she take a hint? Didn't she realize he wasn't being coy when he went home with other women? That he wasn't playing hard to get when he didn't return her calls or answer his door? She wanted to lock him down, but he couldn't stay with her. He couldn't start seeing that body as it lay in the casket, hear her words as she told him that she was leaving. And the only thing that would make it go away 
He'd start seeing that body as it lay in the casket, hear her words as she told him she was leaving, and the only thing that would make it go away would be the drink. I'd like to say that you've grown into a fine man, but we both know it isn't true. You've changed very little since high school, and I doubt you ever will. Well, that's something to work with. Do we go to high school together then? Were you some little nerd that I never called back? Maybe some one-night stand who I ghosted after I was done? Had she had the pimples when he first started? He had only looked away for a second, but she had just the slightest hint of acne across her cheek, like a dusting of freckles. They weren't the livid pustules of a teen experiencing her first crop, but the last light kiss of puberty that an 18-year-old might experience before they simply dried up and were no more than a momentary problem after that. She smiled as she noticed him noticing them, and he thought again that her teeth seemed odd. Had she once had braces, maybe? Oh no, we were never intimate. I think you would have liked to be, but she paused long enough to take a sip of her drink, the liquid having returned by some unnoticed bartender. You were so painfully shy around me. You could speak confidently to any cheerleader or popular girl in school, but you were utterly befuddled by me and my braces and my glasses. Derek was speechless. This girl couldn't be who she was claiming to be. Lisa was... I'm sorry, Derek said, glancing over and seeing someone he hoped he'd recognized. I see someone I know. I should really say hi to them. He slid off the bar stool and onto wobbly legs that almost spilled him onto the floor. The young woman, younger now than she had been at the start, smiled at him as she showed off a mouthful of metal. Take your time, Derek. I don't have anywhere to be. I'll be waiting for you. I'm always waiting for you, she said, throwing the last at Derek's back as he rushed off into the small crowd. He thought the woman's name was Cindy, or maybe Chelsea. He only recognized her from the back because that was the most memorable image of her that he had in his head. Her blonde hair was still long and soft as it rolled down her back, and when he approached, she was talking with a small group of hazy people. Their faces looked scrunched, their features swirls of eraser marks. And when he touched her, she turned around slowly. Thank God, Cindy. <laughs> Did the guy on the sidewalk talk you into this weird little... But he stopped when he saw her face. Her face was as smooth and featureless as the others. She took one look at him and walked away without any word. Cindy, he called, taking a step towards her before catching sight of a familiar brown ponytail as its owner leaned over the bar. Mary was a staple at McLeod's. She might have been a little too old for Derek, her status as a cougar established before Derek had taken his first drink at the bar, but she had been sweet for an evening. He batted at the ponytail playfully, waiting for her to turn around so he could ask her what the hell was going on. She had been a little icy to him since they had slept together, but surely she'd help him figure this out before he had a freaking breakdown. She turned around angrily when he batted her braid, and Derek saw that she was also smooth and featureless, from eyebrows to chin. She huffed and took herself elsewhere, and as Derek watched, he became aware that most of the people in the bar were women who looked very familiar. One night stands, old girlfriends, sexual conquests of every flavor, and all of them milling about him like they couldn't see him, or couldn't care less. They pressed in as their numbers swelled, but Derek remembered them all. It was impressive and depressing how many women you could sleep with in a six-year period, and Derek found that he was adrift in a sea of jaded barflies. They had their own tidal pull, and as Derek tried to push his way to the door, they seemed to pull him back towards the bar with each push he made to escape them. When someone wrapped a hand around his and pulled him back towards a stool, he accepted it without protest. It was not Lisa, and she looked a lot more familiar now. She wore the same ripped leggings and puffy sweater dress that she had been wearing the night of the party. The leggings were no longer just ripped artfully. Derek could see glass shards and torn skin beneath them. Her sweater was dotted with red splotches, and he might have thought that she'd been shot if he hadn't known what had killed her. The left lens of her glasses was a spider web, 
pristine ice broken by a stray rock. And he did remember that. After all, they had buried her in those glasses. And he remembered it being the only thing imperfect about her as she lay in her casket. It was the only thing real about her after the coroner was done making her beautiful again. Why are you here? Derek asked, watching the throng of women as they surged around the bar he was sitting on. It's not enough that I live with your ghost every day. Now I have to see you too. Oh, gee. I'm sorry that I'm the stick you jab yourself with on every occasion. Unfortunately for you, I'm your greatest fear. Not me. Not really. But what I represent. You can't let yourself be close to anyone like you were with me. You can't open up and embrace intimacy. In a way, I'm the manifestation of your issues with intimacy. You bury your fears and woes in endless seas of sex, and you're never satisfied. No matter how much you drink, or how many women you go to bed with, you'll never lose my ghost. Not until you let yourself forget me. His phone buzzed again, and he saw that Charlene had texted him. Her message was a little different this time. She told him that she was sorry for bothering him so much, and how she would stop trying to insert herself into his life. She apologized for not being enough for him and hoped that he had a good night. Derek looked at his phone, feeling his stomach knot, as he thought about how he'd run off another one. She seemed nice. Maybe you could give her a chance. I can't, Derek said. What if I let her down like I let you down? What if I accidentally kill her too? Lisa smirked, and it did interesting things to her broken face. You blame yourself for my death. But did you really have anything to do with it? Derek scoffed. How had he not caused her death? He'd been too focused on drinking and partying to make sure that his girlfriend got home safely. He had stood right there and let her leave with someone else instead of taking her himself. Why do you think that's your fault? I would have left regardless. You no more caused my death than the tree we hit did. Let it go. Derek could see that night, the same night he always saw when it haunted his nightmares. They had been at Marty Jenner's party, when he held before Christmas every year. And Derek was drunker than he'd ever been. Lisa didn't drink. He had dragged her to the party mostly so he could show off his new girlfriend. And it was clear she was done with it. When he tried to kiss her, she had pulled away, telling him that his breath smelled like rotten fruit. He had told her not to be such a prude, and she had told him that she was leaving. Kyle Werner, one of the guys on the football team with Derek, had been leaving too. He was less drunk than Derek, but that wasn't saying much. Derek had been hung over the next day when her mother called to give him the bad news. Kyle had wrapped his vehicle around a tree three blocks from his house, killing both of them instantly. Derek had never forgiven himself for that, and he'd stayed pickled for the rest of his life. Looking at Lisa now made him feel even worse. Forget about it, and forget me. Stop torturing yourself. You had nothing to do with my death. Let yourself be happy. Let go before it's too late. She swam before his eyes. It was only then that Derek was aware he was crying. His phone chirped again. He saw that Charlene was calling this time. As he picked it up, he saw the women part, leaving him a clear path to the exit. Give her a chance. A real chance. Let yourself be happy for a change. Derek left, apologizing for being so distant, as he and Charlene made plans to meet up at McLeod's in a half hour. So, said the barker, as Derek stepped back into the street, you discover something truly terrifying. Derek nodded. Yeah. Yeah, I I might have found something I lost, too. He dropped another 20 onto the box as he walked and the barker smiled as he watched him leave shakily. Ha ha ha. Another satisfied customer.
For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to the stories, I'm going to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand-blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like, or there's Mr. Creepypasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. Some other ones I really suggest, the Gashel Greens, which is also one that I drink, and the Hibiscus, which has helped me out a lot with my high blood pressure. Uh, if you guys also like the, if you want to see like the Hibiscus Tea, I think it's also called the Jeff the Killer Tea. So, goddamn, Jeff is constantly in my life and there's no escaping him. Once again, that's Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, Brimstone Pandemonium, Cal Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Buddy Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jake Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Check, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Paralinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Pikamel, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Dark Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Broconut 509, Stricket, Ready Cougar, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Vester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.